And we're back. Okay, excellent. So uh, during the break, a couple people said, hey, I tried to run the survey program. Thank you. Uh, and I got an unsupported class version error. What does that mean? Um, so I posted to the uh, Google community uh, about it. Um, that means the version of the, the Java runtime that you're using, and we'll talk about that in a second, um, is uh, older than the compiled version of the, uh, of the class files that we're trying to run in that jar file. It basically means that your job is too old. Um, and apparently on the, uh, the CX Linux machines, um, by default, you get like open JDK 1.7. Well, you need JDK 1.8. Um, and so then uh, I have to admit, I'm not an expert in exactly all of the options for configuring the, uh, the Linux machines that they have here. So, um, uh, but what I will tell you is here's the Java that I use. Here's the Java that the grader will use. So I want to be the Java that you use. Um, uh, and so when I do a which Java in my environment, here's the path that I get. I also have set the, oops, I also set the Java home environment variable to that path. And when I run Java dash version, I get 1.8.0 uh, under bar 0 0.5. Um, so please uh, adjust your environment accordingly. Um, if you're not too sure how to set this stuff or if you're having problems, please uh, post here to the Google community and um, I'm sure one of your uh, uh, fellow students would be able to help you out. Anybody here from the cat? Any cats in the room? One? One? Really? That's, it used to be that like half the cat took my course. Anyway, uh, they're probably all working for Puppet now anyway. Okay. Uh, yeah, I went there. They ought not. So as a matter of fact, 05 is super old and uh, hey, cat guy, update that. <laughs> um, it's, yeah, it's, I should, I'll, I'll submit a ticket. Maybe um, to get that uh, to get that updated because while there isn't like new functionality or anything, there are a couple of like JVM bug fixes and a lot of security fixes. So uh, yeah, something that uh, should be updated. Anyway, how's that? Oh, um, okay. So I want to write some code. Uh, watching that Uncle Bob video made me hungry for code. So. Um, Let's take a look at uh, at Project Zero. So, uh, Project Zero um, is uh, when I first taught this course. Believe it or not, there were even more projects, and the first one was just sort of like get started by writing a simple student class. Um, and after uh, I don't know, the second or third time I, I taught it, it's like we don't need that uh, Project Zero anymore. Um, we'll just go straight into Project One so that we can have you know more interesting projects in the end. But um, I found that is a, uh, so I use it now as an introduction to sort of the project environment for you guys. So what I'm going to do I'm going to start today, and what I hope to finish next week is sort of walking you through what it's like to work on a project to show you sort of all the pieces and stuff. I'm going to do it for Project Zero, so we'll see what it's like working with the IDE. We'll see what it's like writing unit tests, running integration tests, working with Maven, all of that good stuff. Um, so that uh, then you can take it and work on project one, which we'll learn about definitely before we uh, leave here tonight. So um, in project one, uh, you're, there is a student class. A uh, student class represents a student. It is a subclass of a class called human, which is part of the example code that I wrote. Um, we didn't discuss it in, well. We discussed it in lecture. The lecture is on YouTube. Um, and so the whole idea of working with this uh, project is to work with someone else's class, my code. Um, so for you, working with my code. And also to learn about inheritance and virtual methods and then to read program arguments from the command line. Um, for your projects, for your project one, you'll be doing all of this and more. So um, what I do is I have something called uh, a Maven archetype that creates a very simple uh, class called student. And uh, it looks something like this. I'm not going to go into terribly too much detail now because we'll see it once I actually create it. Um, so it's got some methods and um, I guess a couple important things to note. It's got a constructor that calls its superclasses uh, constructor. And then it has a couple of methods, none of which is implemented. It says something that actually overrides something. It's got a two string and then it's got a main method which initially just prints out you know, missing command line arguments. Okay, so to get started with this project, uh, we use something called a Maven archetype. So. Um, Maven, as you'll see in the in the lectures that are online, is a tool for building Java projects. Again, there are lots of moving well, there are lots of pieces parts to uh, a Java project, right? You've got the the source code, 
for the application. You've got the test code for the application. You might have other things in the application, such as you know image files or sounds or whatever that are played. You might have configuration files. Um, and over the years, uh, as Java has evolved and grown and mature, and there are more frameworks and there are more you know technologies and everything, um, the community needed a tool to manage all of this stuff. So not only manage, uh, well, they needed a, to, to to manage. Uh, to, to manage building projects and to have uh, like a standard format so that when you know you go to a new project at least the build process is familiar and, and files are laid out in places that you expect um, so that you don't need to like spend you know the first minutes days weeks months figuring out just how to build the software no you can work on it so maven provides a couple of things one is sort of a, a standard layout for your uh, your java code and when we create the architect we'll see that um, but it also uh, manages a third party dependency so you can say hey i want to write a junit test and you say i want this version of junit and you know when you run the maven command it'll go and look for uh, uh, look for that for all of the jar files all of the artifacts that you need to use junit out on the uh, on the web it'll download it all to your local machine, configure everything correctly so that you don't need to worry about it. Um, and this ends up saving you know, hours and hours of time because someone else has written this build tool for you. Um, these archetypes are, uh, are things that I've created. So Maven has this archetype mechanism that lets you very easily um, get off the ground with a project. Basically, it's like a project template. And so uh, I've created a bunch of these, and for, I think, projects one and four and five, you get started with the project by starting with these templates. So I want you to learn about Maven. I want you to learn how to use Maven. I want you to sort of see, oh, wow, here's what happens on the inside, and here's how you, know, you could do stuff yourself. I don't want you to do it yourself, because I want you to focus on writing code, not figuring out how to use this Maven tool. So, um, it gets, uh, so, so that helps you uh, get started. Um, so let's just go ahead and do that. Um, and I guess something else, though, that uh, I, I use for my own code and that uh, if you'd like to use it for your code, you're welcome to, is GitHub. Have you guys heard of GitHub? I think yeah, I use it a lot here. So um, I might go a little fast, but let me know if I go too fast. So uh, not the work GitHub. Um, okay. So and actually, well, while I'm here, so um, from the homepage, you can navigate to... Uh, for, to my GitHub, either by looking at the source code link up here, or then I've got a little um, badge over, oops, badge over here, which goes to me on GitHub. Um, here in the Portland State Java uh, repository, I have uh, all of the source code for the, the, the class, um, including things like the, uh, well, all the tools I use for, for grading, um, the projects, uh, I don't know, and there's a lot here to evolved over like 15 years. Um, there's just a, a lot here. Anyway, um, it's there for you to peruse. Uh, it's uh, there for you to see. And also, um, if you find something wrong with the code or something like that, feel free to um, submit an issue um, in, in, in GitHub. Uh, it's a good way of sort of making this stuff visible. Here again, um, I want my the work. I want the class to be visible to everybody, and GitHub works really well for that. Um, so this is like the course that uh, this is the code that I write um, just for the course in general. But we're also going to write a lot of code this uh, uh, th this term. So I'm going to create a new repository for um, for the term. I'm going to call it Portland State oops, State Java Summer 2016. Okay, summer zero. Um, and let's see here. I want to make it public. And this is like you know source code that we well uh, yeah, yeah source code that we write together in uh, advanced programming. With Java. So let's see here. Uh, so that's the name of the, the description. Public. Anybody can see it. Um, please initialize it with a readme. I want the git ignore for Java. Excellent. Uh, a license. Yeah. What did I choose? Apache. Oops. 2.0. I think is what I used. Oops. What did I use in mine? Oops. My profile. I'm almost certain that I used uh, Apache license. Yep, Apache license 2.0. Good. Always good to have a, a license on your code, especially when it's available to everybody. That way they know how they can use it. OK, so I'll create that repository. Whoa, is that little copy machine still? I guess it's only when you fork it. OK, cool. So I just created a new repository. Um, and for those of you who aren't familiar with GitHub, so now up there on, you know, on this website, 
Um, GitHub provides me access to uh, the source code in this repository using a tool called Git. Um, and uh, so let's see here. I want to, um, oh, they've moved everything around. How do I get the little SSL? Like a clone or download? So let's see here. Um, so I am going to clone it here locally. Um, Okay, so I'm going to say git clone. So this is on my local machine. I'm basically going to make a, uh, a local, not copy, a, a local repository from this remote repository. And now, uh, let's see here. So if I go into the Portland State Java 2000, oops, summer 2016, um, I'm going to unplug because you don't want to hear the boop, boop, boop every time I hit tab. It's now got the license and the readme just the same as up here. Okay, good. You're familiar to people, you've seen this kind of stuff before. Yeah, okay, good. Okay, uh, so now I've got a repository and I want to put some stuff in that repository. And what I want to put in it is a, um, a, a, a fresh brand new uh, project from, uh, for, for my student class. So I'm going to run this command line here. Oh, and, and by the way, so there's this tool called Maven um, that uh, you, you can see in the, in the notes or you can use the Google and say, hey, I want to download Apache Maven and you download it, install it, and put it on your path. It's, it's all good stuff. Um, and, and so if I use this big old command line here, I'm basically telling Maven, hey, I want to create a new Maven project from an archetype. And it's located um, in a, it was called a catalog up on my bin tray, which is where I deploy all my artifacts. And it's got a name. It's got this group. Uh, well, it's got this name called Student Archetype. And it's in this like organization. It's got a group ID of edu pdx cs 410 j so I'm going to paste all that here, and I'm going to run that. It might ask me some questions. OK, so um, Maven projects create an, an artifact of some sort, right? You have source code, and you compile it into something. Um, that something could just be like a library, a jar file. It could be um, a, uh, a web application. Uh, it could be uh, all sorts of you know, other uh, different things. Um, and, and ultimately, though, what the, what the Maven project creates is this artifact, which they can then share with other people. Um, and when you share it with other people, it has to have a name. It has to have an identifying organization or a group. And this is the group ID. So uh, the group ID uh, is, uh, I, I'm going to use uh, edu pdx cs 410 j Oh, and graduate students, I'd like you to use the 410 j class, even though I know you're in 510, because there's only one grading script, and it expects 410 j So... Sorry you're not getting your money's worth there, but hopefully you'll get it in other places. Um, and, the, and this is my group ID, so I'm going to use uh, edu pdx cs 410 j and then my login ID, which is Whitlock. Okay, so that's the group ID, and actually all of the, um, all of the artifacts that I create as like Dave up here on the stage are going to be Whitlock. The ones that like uh, you'll use in your classes are the classes, they're not mine, so they don't have the Whitlock there. They're just the edu pdx cs 410 j Artifact ID. Um, I believe this is outlined in the assignment. Oh yeah, there it is. Artifact ID will be student. So that means, well, the jar that it'll create will be student.jar. The version uh, 10 snapshot, why not? And then it says the version of the package. So in Java, the package is the sort of namespace for classes, right? You've probably seen that before. And so then uh, the whole idea is that you've got a class and they're all grouped together in something called uh, a package. The package usually has the same name as the group ID. That's what I want from default. I'll accept that. It asks me, hey, is this all the stuff correct? Yes, it is. And if it's not, I just blow it away really easily and start it over again. OK. Um, warning, don't override. OK, so it looks like everything was successful. It has this warning here. I don't know why it says don't override file, but I think everything's OK. So what did it do? It created a directory called student. Inside student, there are some, oh, there's a target. Directory already, that's not, huh. anyway. Um, it's got something called a POM XML, it's got something, uh, there's a source directory. It's got all sorts of good stuff. Okay, well, so now I've got, uh, it's, it's got some files. I wanna look at the files. I wanna look at the files in IntelliJ. So uh, IntelliJ is uh, my uh, Java IDE of, of choice. Let me just close that project. Well, let's close all the projects. Okay. Um, uh, IntelliJ is free to download. There is a community edition, which uh, I think will be sufficient for this class. There's also uh, Enterprise Professional. What is it called? 
Intergalactic Edition, um, which uh, I believe uh, is, is is available for students for a long either a long evaluation or whatever. I've seen a couple of nods, okay, and there was like discussion on the community. So um, you know, feel free to I guess you got create an account with with JetBrains, people that make IntelliJ. Um, but this is a professional tool. That's what I use at work. It's what my coworkers. Uh, use it's. Um, I find it's, it's very powerful, um, and it's it's basically the you know the leading. I think it's fair to say it's the leading choice for professional developers. You may also use Eclipse if you like Eclipse. I don't like Eclipse. I much prefer IntelliJ. You know, Eclipse has some clunky things that uh, I think IntelliJ does better. Anyway, enough of a soapbox. Um, okay, so well, we've created this new project. Now I want to work with it in my IDE. So um, let's see here. I think I'm going to say import project. And now I gotta find the darn thing. Uh, oops! No, 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 no. <laughs> That's not. I don't want to import every project in that directory. I just want to import one of them. So, um, and get in summer 2016 student. Okay, I think you select the palm. So, uh, so the palm is the project object model, which is like the Maven configuration file. We'll take a little bit of a look at it. Um, Later, okay, and now it's asking me all sorts of questions. It's like, hey, I found something that looked like a Maven file, um, or yeah, there, and then ask you all these questions about like IntelliJ stuff. Uh, the answer is yes, all good enough. Okay, and it's like, hey, I found a Maven project, and uh, it creates this artifact with the edu pdx cs 410 j Whitlock um, uh, group ID, and the artifact ID is student in the version one of the snapshot. That sounds like what I want. Um, Oh, open product structure after import. I wonder what that does. Uh, so yes, that's what I want to import. Ah, it's asking me, hey, what version of Java, which version of the JDK, the JDK, well, okay, SDK, Software Development Kit, Java Development Kit, do you want to use? I want Java 8. I've installed Java 8 here on my uh, my laptop, um, and I'm pro I probably had to configure IntelliJ at some point to find that JDK. You might have to do that too. It's all nicely documented on the web. Wow, I clicked that thing and all sorts of things showed up. Um, there's a lot of stuff to JDK. That's awesome. Um, the project name is student. That's where it lives. That's where it's going to put uh, the project configuration files for IDEA, for IntelliJ. Next, 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 next. Accept your license. Oh, uh, project structure. You know what? I don't think I, I, I didn't want to do that after all. That's not terribly interesting. Okay. So uh, it's gotten this far. There's a little uh, thing saying, hey, unregistered VCS root detected. VCS is a version control system. And it's saying, hey, you know, a little clippy comes up and says, it looks like you're using Git. And, and I'm like, damn right I am. And so I want to add that root. I want to tell IntelliJ, hey, listen, this source code is managed by Git. And that will enable the integration so that it makes it, as we'll see in a little bit, makes it really easy for me to, uh, to work with that. So, um, Super sweet. So now here I am in IntelliJ, um, and over here on the left, I can navigate the file structure for this project. Um, so there's something called the palm XML, which is a big old XML file, because really there's only one kind of XML file, and it's a big old one, um, that has all sorts of information about the project. I'm not going to go into details now. You can watch the Maven lecture. We might come back to it in future classes. But basically, I think what you need to know for tonight is this tells Maven how to work with your project. It does things like defines um, oh configurations of various plugins for Maven that let you do things like run unit tests and run some reports. It, uh, it defines all your dependencies. So it's like, hey, I'm using like JUnit version 4.12, and I only use it for test code, stuff like that. Um, and you'll notice that some of these are, you know, like you know my dependencies that are here in the CS410J group ID, and then other things uh, like org hamcrest. Well, we'll talk about what hamcrest means in a little bit. Um, you know, it comes from other places. So um, I recommend that you explore the uh, the palm.xml. Um, but uh, you know, I think in terms of where you invest the time, uh, you'll probably get a better return on your investment if you focus on writing code as opposed to like understanding the magic um, behind Maven, at least at the beginning of the course. Okay, let's look at what um, what what is here. So all these files are created from that Maven archetype. So it's gone through and um, uh, and set down some files. Uh, it created a student file, and this is the file that was um, that was there in the uh, uh, in, in the assignment, 
Um, and so it's got a constructor and it's got some Java doc. I decided to hide that. Um, it's got a couple of methods. Okay, this is really neat. It's got something called student test. So this is a unit test for the, uh, for the student class. And then it's got something called student IT, which is an integration test. And we'll talk a little more about what an integration test is in a little while. Uh, okay, so I've got a couple of classes here. I haven't made any changes to them yet. I'm going to open up the, uh, the version control tab. Uh, yeah, the version control um, yeah, tab. And it's telling me a couple of things. It says there are a bunch of, um, un huh, there, there are a bunch of unversioned files. Uh, and that's true. I have a couple of files that aren't in um, aren't in GitHub, so aren't in Git. Uh, I noticed for the archetype created a target directory. Now in Maven, the target directory is where all of the uh, all, all of the built artifacts go. So in Java, you have the source code, which is the dot, dot Java file. That's something that's readable by a human, right? Then you compile that into a dot class file, and that's the bytecode for the Java virtual machine. Hopefully, those are familiar terms. You can listen to the webcast to learn more about them. Those are all class files. Those will go in the target directory. Those class files are bundled together in something called a jar file, which is like the library, a Java archive. That goes in a jar, fi a jar file that lives in the target directory. Um, I do not want compiled artifacts, generated artifacts, built artifacts in my source code repository. Source code repository is for a source code. It should be stuff that human reads. It shouldn't be something that's easy to generate. So I don't want the target in uh, in in GitHub. So first thing I'm going to do, actually, uh, so so I don't want it in GitHub. So the first thing I'm going to do is add it to my Git ignore file. Um, do I have a Git ignore file here? I don't. I have one up a level. Um, dot Git ignore. So git ignore is a file is a file that says um, here's all the stuff that when you ask git hey of the files that are here in my uh, in the same directories as my repository which ones should which ones should be ignored which things should never be checked in yeah question um, is that the that when you the yep yes Yes. So, so yes. Yeah, so, yep. Yes. Yes. That's, that's a very good point. Skipped over that. So you know, as you might have noticed, when I was very quickly going through and creating the repository, there was this little option that says, "Hey, do you want to get ignore?" I said, "Yes, I did." What do you want to ignore? I said, I want to ignore like the Java stuff. So here again, these are the compiled, the built artifacts for most Java programs. So it'll ignore anything that's a class file. It will, okay, ignore mobile tools for Java, J2MME. I don't care. Okay, great. I'm going to be using those. But yep, jar files, war files, ears. Um, and then also if the VM crashes, crashes and you get an H, uh, you know, hotspot error PID file, it'll um, ignore that also. There are a couple other things I want to add. So I'm doing a Maven project. I mean, maybe there was an option for Maven now that I think about it. But anyway, um, I want to ignore everything in the uh, in the target directory. So I want to ignore, oops, uh, star slash target star. Um, actually, I just want to say star target. I think is good enough. Uh, and let's see if that took. So now when I ask get, get status, which says, hey, show me all the files that um, aren't in version control, uh, oh, I guess, huh, dot, okay, so I haven't added, um, let's try this, great, it's telling me I've made a change to git ignore, and there's this directory called student which hasn't, um, which hasn't been added, so I will add that here, now I'll do status, and it has a whole bunch of files, and target is not one of them, right, that's good, okay, cool, so, um, I'm going to, Commit my change to dot get ignore. I'm going to say uh, ignore. Oh, you know what? Before I do that, though, I notice that I, I have my palm. I do want that in version control, but then I also have these like IntelliJ files, the dot IML, dot IPR, and dot, dot IWS. I want to get those out of there too. Um, but you know what? Let's uh, let's do this in another window so I can very easily. Oops. Hello. Should 
should have cleaned up my environment before I came. I apologize. Summer 2016. Okay, over here I'm going to edit my git ignore. And uh, I'm going to say ignore IntelliJ file. So um, I don't think it's a very good practice to um, commit your IDE configuration files to source code. I've seen a lot of projects where they do, they'll have like the eclipse.classpath or whatever. Um, I found it's not very portable uh, because the IDEs sort of are configured for like one person's environment. So uh, um, I don't do this and I don't recommend that you do it, but you know, it's a free country man, so I don't know. Okay, so I want to ignore that. And you know, I also want to add a little comment to say why. Um, because, you know, I'll look at this in a couple years, like, what's the target directory? And like, oh yeah, right. Um, ignore uh, the Maven target directory because it contains built artifacts, not source code. Ah, VI. Next week I'll use Emacs and impress you. Uh, it won't be impressive. Okay, cool. Let's try that. Um, okay, now when I say, tell me all the stuff that is that I might want to add to uh, version control. Oh, crap. It still has those things. Maybe I need to put stars there. Yeah, I do. Star. By the way, um, you want to do something good for your career, learn a text editor. Um, I, I'm being serious. Yes, I've been doing this for a long time, but uh, learning VI, I'm like barely competent VI, much better at Emacs. Um, there are certain things that I can do in, in those text editors that will, you know, that save me, have saved me days over the course of my career. Um, it's just a good thing to learn. Yeah, question. So you didn't ignore your .idea folder? Oh! Probably because it's a hidden file. It didn't try to try to t track it. Do you have like some settings to ignore hidden files? I don't know. Maybe I do. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me somehow. I might just be lucky that way. I that's a good point. Yeah, that's another way of doing it. Um, that there's so, but you know, I, I guess. Um, I think in that case, so, so yes, uh, I, I can I can either edit my git ignore for this repository, or I can configure my local git installation and say, hey, always ignore .iws. I think in this case, for me, my preference would be to um, uh, to change it in the git ignore, because that way it goes to the repository so that anybody else checks out the repository has it ignored also. So even if they haven't configured their local installation, but you're right, I could, I could probably do that. I would get the same result for me, but yeah. Um, but actually, I'm getting no result right now because it's not working. Why isn't it working? IML, IPR, IWS. You're right. I did. Thank you. Um, you know what you're doing. That's awesome. Good. Uh, so let's so yeah, say you get to do the reset head. Oh, boy. Awkward. How did they get added to stage? Oh, because I added it to stage. Yeah, that would do it. Um, Okay, so what I'm doing, okay, uh, so what is he talking about? Um, he's, uh, basically, what, uh, what I did was I told Git, hey, go ahead, and um, I added the, the, the parent directory, that student directory, and then it said, okay, I add, I'm going to schedule that thing for inclusion and version control and everything under it. So even though I told it to ignore IML files, uh, now I previously told it, no, include those IML files. So I was wrong. Um, and so luckily, Git, it has some nice things. Like it tells you, you know, these things, um, uh, these things are uh, eligible to be added. They're already staged. They're like ready to be committed. Um, but if you don't want to commit, because I'm use the git reset. And so I will do that now. And student IWS. Oh, interesting. Okay, this is looking a little better. Okay, so what is git telling me? Uh, oh wait, it's got a swap file? Oh no, because no, I'm running it in the guy. Okay. Now I shouldn't get that. Yeah, okay, awesome. Okay. So it's telling me a couple of things. 
Um, it's saying that there was a, a file in version control that has been changed, git ignore. That is true. I changed my git ignore file. Good. And it's saying, hey, there are also some uh, some files that are getting ready to be added to uh, to version control. And that's those. It's like, good, that's what I want. So now I'm going to commit my changes um, to my local repository. So I'm going to say uh, ignore uh, some more common uh, file types that are used with some uh, yeah, some common file types that are used with Java uh, application uh, Java development. Did ignore. Okay, and so that said, uh, I, I basically said, okay, I've made some changes. I want to put them in the repository. And so now when I do the status command, they don't show up anymore because the uh, they're already in the repository. I haven't made any local changes. Now um, I want to do the same for the stuff in the student, which is okay. Add um, the uh, files generated by the Maven archetype uh, to get to the Git repository. To the Git repository. Repository. Everything in the student directory. Great. Committed four files. Uh, status. Everything's there. Now it's telling me that my branch is ahead of origin master. Now origin, so there are two repositories here. I'm sorry, I'm getting a little less than I get. I hope it's not too boring. Um, when I cloned it, I made a repository on my local machine. But when I cloned it, it contains a reference back to like its parent, its origin, right? So we're like a superhero movie or something like that, right? Got bitten by a radioactive spider. Yeah. Uh, wasn't Civil War awesome though? Right? Awesome movie? Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll save the commentary for next week, I guess. Um, anyway, so there's my local repository, and it's all tied to um, uh, the repository up on GitHub. So, so it's remote. Um, so I can do the following. I can say a git push. And what that does is it takes the changes in my local repository and puts them back up to, uh, to GitHub. So now when I go back up to GitHub, um, yep, I, uh, I refresh... And now I've got some new stuff. So this is how GitHub works. It lets you uh, make some changes locally, uh, commit them locally, and then push them up so that everybody else can see them. Um, and so, uh, well, you, you tell me. What, what are some of the reasons why I might want to put my source control, uh, my, my, my source code under revision control? So, uh, sorry, again, I didn't hear you. Yes. So one of the nice things about our revision control is that when you commit, and one of the things that I do, and you'll see me do, once my code is stable, I commit it. Because it's like, ha, ah, it works. Huh. I want to save that, right? Because then if I break something and I'm like, oh, forget it, I just want to flip the table over and start over again, I just say, oh, go back to that revision that's there in revision control. Forget all those changes that I made. I want to start over again. That's a good reason. What else? Multiple developers. Multiple developers, right. We probably won't see it too much in this class. But Git has all sorts of great support for uh, great tools for supporting multiple people working on the same code base, right? So it's like I change a file, you change a file. Oh, did we change them in a way where we can sort of weave them all together and integrate them nicely, or is it like oh, you changed line forty-seven, you changed line forty-seven, and oh, you need to reconcile something now? So yeah, it really enables enables that. I don't know anything else. Yep. Yeah, you're making a, a backup, right? So, um, you know, so like I don't know, a meteor hits my laptop or whatever. Don't worry, you know, our code is safe in the cloud on on, on GitHub. Um, and actually, it's it's Git, and so you can you know mirror all sorts of other things. Um, anyway, it's really nice. All right, that was a slight diversion through uh, through GitHub, but we'll see that um, that we'll use it quite a bit. So um, right now, my IntelliJ is out of sync with my file system, but if I refresh, uh, now things are in version control and there are no local changes. Okay, that's very nice. So, let's take a look at the student application. So now I've got the source code. Um, let's uh, take a look at that assignment again and figure something out. So now I've got the project. Okay, so the Generated Maven project contains unit and integration tests uh, to get you started with test-driven development. Um, okay, and I can build the project and run its test by invoking the uh, verify phase of, uh, of Maven. So if I say Maven, uh, let's go back to the student folder. If I say Maven verify, uh, actually, I want to delete that target directory. If I say maven verify, this will do the following. It will compile the source code. It will compile the unit tests. It will run the unit tests against the source code. If all that stuff passes, as a matter of fact, it only goes on the next step if the previous one passes. So 
uh, it'll try to compile the, the, the source code, and if it compiles, great. It'll try to compile the test code, and compile, if the test code compiles, great. It'll run the tests, and then uh, it'll run the unit test, um, and then if the unit test passes, it'll run, what call, run what's called the integration tests. So both unit tests and integration tests are automated tests, but they have a different scope. So unit tests, as you saw Uncle Bob doing, are very, well, they're targeted to the unit of programming, meaning that they test like a single method, and a single method within a class. So they're really um, code specific. They are, um, again, very targeted, and uh, with test-driven development, it's sort of like how you write the code, by writing the test, for, by, by writing the test first. Integration tests are bigger picture. Integration tests um, usually, uh, well, integration tests are meant to uh, test higher level functionality, sort of you know, the end-to-end -end functionality of your application. And oftentimes, unit tests, um, wait, 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 sorry, unit tests are all about you know, the code, and so they're small, and they're usually very fast to run, right? So it's just like, I'm running a test, and I'm creating a couple of objects, and I'm calling a couple of methods, and I'm asserting a couple of things are, are, are true, and I'm done. Integration tests, because they test that end-to-end -end functionality, require that your entire application be built and that your entire application be run, which can be comparatively more expensive. So where unit tests run in milliseconds, um, integration tests might require you to do things like stand up a web server or stand up a database or build a whole bunch of your application and run things. Um, and as such, they are um, two different testing concepts, and in Maven, they are run in two different phases. Because the whole idea is that your unit tests are like your sanity check, and you want a quick sanity check, right? It's like, okay, does everything still compile, and does like the basic you know, internal functionality run? And so you, probably, you do that all the time, right? Every time you make a code change, you run your unit tests because they're thorough, um, they're targeted, but they're also fast, and so you can afford to do that. Your integration tests, on the other hand, are something that you maybe run um, sort of after you've run a bunch of, uh, of unit tests, or you sort of finished a piece of functionality. Maybe you've, you've written unit tests for several classes, and now you want to test the end-to-end -end functionality, which require multiple uh, classes, and maybe your application being deployed and all that stuff. You run those less often because they're expensive. They're very valuable because they test the end-to-end -end, uh, functionality, the integration of all the pieces parts working together. Um, so they're, they're very valuable, but they tend to be more expensive. So you get all the little units working first, and then you test them all together in integration. Um, this is a, a, a sort of a new concept that I'm emphasizing in the class this year, so it might be a little new. I don't remember if all the materials are, are updated uh, to this, so if you have questions about the distinction between uh, integration tests and unit tests, please feel free to ask them. Okay. And oh, yeah, while I was talking, probably finished long before I was done talking because it ran in a whopping six seconds, it went through and did that. So compile the source code, compile the test code, Ran the, ran the unit tests and then ran, well, compiled the integration tests and ran the integration tests. And it gives you um, output like the following. It tells you, uh, you know, there's all the stats stuff going by, but like, here I am running your unit tests. So it ran something called student test. So let's take a look at that student test. Is that readable? Yeah, pretty much. I'm going to close this to get a little bit more screen real estate. Okay. So, um, unlike Uncle Bob, I didn't, I'm not going to start you from scratch, scratch, because I wanted to give you an example of a unit test, and I wanted to make sure that, like, you know, the project actually runs and everything like that. So, um, I have a simple uh, unit test here called a student test, and it creates a student, and uh, a student has, uh, I can navigate to the student constructor like this, and a student has some information that the constructor takes, a name, an array list of classes, uh, a GPA, and a gender. And uh, it creates that student. The name of the student is name, which is Pat. And then I make an assertion in my unit test. So the whole idea is um, behind really any test, there's a pattern. Um, uh, uh, it's the given when then pattern. So the whole idea is that you set up some state. So it's like, given these conditions, when I do something, then I expect something to happen. And so uh, here, because it's very simple, sort of the given and the, and the when, well, I guess the given here is setting up the pat. It's like, okay, yep, here's my student, here's my state, and I'm gonna do something to it. In this case, I'm going to get its name, and uh, what I expect to happen, what I will assert, what I test, what I assume to be true when I write this test, is that uh, the uh, pat.getName will return a value that is equal to the variable name here. 
Okay, so very simple, but that's sort of how the, that's how this unit test is uh, is structured. Okay. Um, yeah. Sure. Yes. So, at test, um, uh, key, keywords. Uh, if you see something in Java that begins with an at, it's something called an annotation. So, um, initially in the in the early versions of Java, um, you had you could declare classes, you could declare methods, you could declare fields, all that good stuff. But um, along the way, a lot of uh, there are a lot of frameworks that wanted to add additional information to your classes. There are special things about your methods. They should be interpreted. They have to, they have additional meaning, sort of metadata associated with them. And so, in Java five, I don't know, a long time ago now, they added um, this this uh, this tool called annotations. And um, lots of program elements can have annotations. You can put annotations on classes, on methods, on fields, on statements, all sorts of good stuff. And it's extra information that you add to your program that isn't so much about the direct execution of the of the code. All that stayed the same, but it's like hints to other tools. Okay, so what does that mean here? Uh, in a test, uh, when you see a method that is annotated with at test, that tells the frame the JUnit framework that hey, this method right here, this is a test. And so then when you run JUnit. What JUnit does, it uses a library called Reflection, which is covered in week five or something like that, to interrogate the class at runtime. So it's running the running the class. It says, hey, class, tell me all your methods. Are any of them annotated with at test? Oh, they are? Great. I will run that as a test method. I will consider that a test. So how, that's how you identify um, test methods in JUnit 4 and beyond. Um, previously, there was a convention. You might see this both in my code and the other code that you've seen. Um, that before they had annotation support in the language, there was a naming convention that uh, that that um, tests use. All test methods had to be public, had to return void, and uh, had to start with the letters T E S T. So it was test blah blah blah, whatever. So uh, you might see that pattern used here. Um, what I use now, and um, what I encourage you to use, is this at test annotation because it very explicitly calls out, you know, this method is a test. Good question. Okay, so that's the unit test. Um, I also want to talk about, so that the unit test, and that passed. Yay, good, the code works, or at least that much of the code works. Then it also runs something uh, called an integration test. Um, and actually, let me go back to the assignment uh, quickly. Oh, actually, I'll get to the integration test in a second. So, um, Okay, sorry, I, I was wrong. So maybe verify there, there was a step in there that I missed. Compile the code, compile the tests, run the tests, run the unit tests, um, uh, create the application, uh, or rather create the artifact. So um, I've so this project creates a, a jar file. A jar file is a, a, an archive, a, a file of files that contains a bunch of class files and other things, some metadata, stuff like that. You can configure the jar file to be what's called an executable jar, meaning that when you pass it uh, to the java-jar command, it will find a, a class and execute its main method. Um, and in this case, it will execute the main method of the student class. So I've got things configured, and you can look at it. It's got a, a, a method called main. So public stack void main is like, well, like main and C. It's where, from the command line, the, um, the program begins executing. So uh, just like, you know, when you run a command line program, uh, it starts with main. It, it, the command line arguments are passed in as an array of strings, and this is where your program starts. GUI applications work differently. We'll learn about that later in the course. But you know, for right now, it starts with main. And right, I mean, you guys have probably been writing lots of command line programs. Hopefully, that's a familiar concept to you. Okay, so it starts uh, uh, with the main method. So if we run this, uh, if we run the executable jar, we say Java dash jar, and then target uh, the name of the jar is created is the no is the um, is the name of the project's artifact 
dash the, the version, so in this case student dash 10 dash snapshot, if I run that, it runs the main method. And what does the main method do? It prints to standard error missing command line arguments. And oops, sure enough, that's what we've got here. So system.error is standard error, print line, missing command line arguments, and it has an exit code of one. So that's, um, that's, that's the program, right? And this is, um, and so then if you look what the assignment says, um, basically, the specification for this program is, hey, when you run the main method and you give it arguments, Dave, mail, 3.64, and algorithms, operating systems, and Java, it, it should print out this, this sentence. Dave has a GPA of 3.64, is taking three classes, algorithms, operating systems, and Java. He says, this class is too much work. So there's a specification of your program. End to end, that's the kind of thing that it's supposed to do. Um, and so what your integration test does is your, inter oops, your integration test um, tests the end-to-end -end functionality of the student. Now, the way it does this is um, this, so right, here, integration test is end-to-end. -end. And so it is running the, the main method. I wrote a little, a little bit of framework to make it easier to run a main method. I've got this um, helper method called invoke main, and you give it, uh, you say the, the, the name of the class whose main method you want to invoke, student.class. We'll learn later what this dot .class syntax all means. But you can uh, run it with, um, th this, this method actually takes an optional number of, uh, of arguments, so it sort of simulates running it from the command line. It has all sorts of magic to capture the contents of standard error and st standard output, as well as the exit code that would be uh, that would have been invoked, or the exit code that was returned from the um, from the uh, from the main method. And now you can test it. So this is testing. These are integration tests, right? This is testing the end-to-end -end application. This is testing it the way the user interacts with it, as opposed to the unit tests, which tests how the the programmer, the coder, you interact with it. So you see they're two very different things. Any questions on that conceptually? Yes? So if you've got an application that has a graphical user interface, uh, what do you do? Uh, what do you think? You in back? Yeah. What? Event loop. Yes, so there are you know testing frameworks out there that will hook up in you know to your windowing system and try to like simulate mouse clicks and stuff like that. Anybody ever use these? What'd you think? Oh, they're awful, aren't they? Um, because what you're dealing with is um, asynchrony. Now we'll get into it later, but um, you know GUI programming is event driven. Because unlike a command line program where it's like start at main and you pretend like it's 1970 and run line one, line two, and jump over here and come back, nice straight line, GUIs don't work like that. A GUI is like, okay, I'm waiting. Click my button, move my, you know, type some text or whatever. I got to deal with that. And for a human, we can you know, understand the interaction. For a computer, that's really tough. Because you know, we can look at all these. So, so for testing GUIs, um, my advice would be to, uh, as a matter of fact, we'll see this later in the course, um, you need different, you need multiple levels of automated tests. So you need your unit tests. So test the code, test the logic. And you can, uh, depending on uh, exactly what kind of application it is, um, if you've got something that's client server, so you've got a, a website, right? So you've got what runs in the browser, what runs on the, uh, on the server. There, uh, you can test your, well, you unit test, you know, let's say your server's in Java and your front end's in JavaScript and HTML. Um, so on the, on the server side, yep, you've got Java, great, you can write unit tests for that. Um, maybe you've got something like a, a REST web service, you can write integration tests that'll hit that web service. As a matter of fact, you will be writing, or you will have the opportunity to write uh, integration tests that test a web service. Then on your client code, well, Luckily, these days, there are um, pretty nice uh, uh, testing frameworks for JavaScript, and they're kind of like JUnit, where you test the JavaScript um, as code. You're not really running it in the browser, maybe you're running it in a simulated browser, uh, you know, and, and things like that. And hopefully, all that testing, which is like testing code or testing something that's easy to interact with, like a, a, a REST interface, hopefully that gives you like 90% of your coverage. So, 
the last 10% of your coverage is going to be like how your UI looks, right? Are things rendered correctly? Are the colors right? Are things positioned correctly when you resize? Um, my personal experience, the experience of many others, is that trying to automate that isn't worth your time. It's not enough good. Is there's not enough return on investment there? So you know you can try, you can write test me, you can use something like Selenium to drive the browser, or you can like try to you know use tools to, to drive a, a, a thick UI or whatever. Um, but it ain't worth it, right? Because what even if you can get to work once, uh, either the uh, because the interaction is asynchronous, you get race conditions like click the button, it should return within five seconds, right? Oh wait, no, it didn't. There must be something wrong. 0.5 seconds later, it comes back, right? It, 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 it just doesn't work. So my, my, my advice to you would be to automate as much as the code um, as, as possible. And these days, you can, uh, you can have good, there are good testing tools for JavaScript. Um, and also, uh, there are good uh, programming patterns for enabling, um, uh, for enabling uh, testable JavaScript. Yeah, how do I get off on that? Anyway, good question. Yes? Um, again, the integration tests end-to-end -end functionality. So in this case, our end-to-end -end functionality is inputs on the command line, stuff written to standard out. The middle, nah, that's sort of the black box. That's all the guts, that's all the plumbing that's exercised by the integration test. Our unit test is the white box test, is the uh, is the implementation is the, in the class of the class. So um, I think it'll be better illustrated by some examples. So I want to dive into that. Let me write, uh, okay, yes. Um, but how about a break first? I've been talking for another hour. Energy's getting a little low, for you guys anyway. I'm gonna crash after this. Okay, another 10 minutes.